Hello, this is the Flow Chats, and I am Flo. Well, my name is Flores, but s- some people call me Flo, and, and you're welcome to. Anyway, today on the podcast, I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with film director Oliver Hermanus. His new movie is coming out today, if you're listening to this podcast on launch day. Either way, when you're listening to this, the movie will already be out and in cinemas um, for you to go watch. So isn't that great? The movie is called Morphe. Yes, yes. The M word. I, I find the whole thing quite interesting. They did a whole sort of PR campaign about the word and about people's experiences with the word. Um, go look it up online with hashtag called a Moffy. They made these interview videos with people like Mark Lottering, Peter Dirk Ace, Bumlani Kango, Armand Okam, Kasper de Vries, where they all speak about their sort of personal experience with the word Moffy. Anyway, the movie takes place in the 1980s in South Africa. It features a pretty unknown cast of young kids playing conscripts who get swept up and sent to Angola and um, have that very unique experience of of being essentially bullied into being these tough men that the the military want them to become. Anyway, I don't want to speak too much about it. Uh, Here's my conversation with Oliver Hermanis. You you spoke about where you're from, but sort of where are you from originally? Where, Where did you grow up? Uh, when I was born, we, we, were fr- we lived in a neighborhood called Montana in Cape Town, uh-huh. which is a very colored neighborhood just next to the airport. Um, and then I lived, we moved to a few places. I lived in Port Elizabeth. I started school in Port Elizabeth, and then when I went to high school, we, by the time we, I was at high school, we were back in Cape Town. And then we lived somewhere else in Cape Town. We lived in, in Kenilworth, and my parents still live there now. Um, so I'm from all over. And then when I, after I came back from doing my master's in England, when I moved back to Cape Town, I started living in, this, in the CBD of Cape Town. And that, in that fact, that felt like I was living in a different city. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've sort of seen Cape Town in these different ways. Mm. And uh, you mentioned master's in England. Mm. What, what did you do that in? Um, I technically did it in film. It's basically film school, but it was mm. a ma- master's program. But it's ultimately a master of arts degree. Film school is basically, you know, three years of fighting. <laughs> um, it's a very competitive... Film, the, the, the film schools teach you the, the competitive nature of filmmaking. Mm. Um, so, you know, it, it's not competitive on a set necessarily, but it's a competitive business. Yeah. And film school is like, a, is like a heightened experience of that because you're all fighting for absolutely everything. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a very stressful, <laughs> unexpectedly stressful experience um, mm. because you... Uh, it's it's an expensive endeavor, and so you know I was on a, I was on a private scholarship, so it was also that feeling that it, ne- it needed to I needed to be good at mm. film school. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And was that always sort of your your ambition, uh, filmmaking? Ma- yes, I mean I I, when I think I was very young. I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer for a mm-hmm. brief moment, uh, but yeah, it's always been filmmaking. But then then there was that feeling that it was impossible. Like mm. when I was at high, yeah, you know, when I was at high school, finishing high school, you know, it was. You wanted you, you know so many people wanted you want to do something, but it doesn't mean that you can or that you that you will. Yeah. You know, it, it means that you uh, you just aspire to it. So there was a moment where I sort of focused more on photography and I started working as a photographer after my undergrad, and that seemed like a compromise. It seemed like mm. you know it was the closest I would get to filmmaking was was having a job like a paid job. I was I was a full, I was a, full, a permanent employee of the Cape Times at that point, mm. and I was very young. I was twenty three, twenty two. And I'd already got this job, and it felt like, okay, well, if this is it, then mm. I might, I might slowly die here. Um, <laughs> so then I, somebody, it just, it was very much luck in a sense that um, I was introduced to the f- a famous f- American film director, Roland Emmerich. He happened to be in Cape Town mm. scouting a movie, and um, uh, my flatmate met him and the director of photography in a restaurant in Cape Town, and they got talking and. Okay. Next thing you know, my friend's calling me. He's like, come over. I'm talking to this American filmmaker. I'm sure you know him. I can't remember his name. He, he's like, lists the movies. like, Independence Day. Something. And I was like, oh, Roland Emmerich. He's like, yeah, 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 that's that guy. Um, mm. And then we became friends uh, with him and his team. And uh, Roland eventually offered me a private scholarship to go to, to film school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, that's a... And that's when I quit my job. And <laughs> yeah. But yes, no, you, you can't plan to that road and Emmerich yeah. enters your life at yeah. 23. It, yeah. Definitely an unconventional story, I guess, and not, yeah, a, totally, not, yeah. a, not, not something someone can try to copy or, or imitate. And it's hilarious because we make such different kinds of work, like Roland yes. makes American blockbusters, and I don't. Um, yeah. So it was interesting to also just be... Um, have that person as your as your benefactor because I was mm. going to I, my, I went to the London Film School. It's a very austere school. It's, mm. You know, it's like what they call a Polish cinema school, where it's taught like um, it's based on the Polish filmmaking um, techniques, um, and so it's very much about creating auteurs. Mm. You know, mm. you as the director are you know a storyteller, and you have something to say. You have a point of view, and so to have to be in that space, and you know, people keep teasing, used to tease me because they're like, yeah, but you know, Roland Emmerich put you here. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you going to become anyway? Yes, it was like 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 you're embarrassed by your mm. by the person that's that's putting you there because they don't fit the mold. Yeah, and uh, yeah, also in in what you you sort of end up making is, mm. is, is there's there's no sort of visible link to sort of his kind of films or his kind of filmmaking or no or, or <laughs> although on the set of Murphy when we were shooting these we had this, all these bombs going off and we were shooting all these action scenes I did think about him I was like well mm. he'll be very proud because here I am <laughs> Finally, with bombs and guns. <laughs> yeah, and then I also found it interesting that you mentioned photography because I think um, um, the the camera work in your films and especially Morphe is is very sort of interesting and, and, and framed in, in peculiar ways. Yeah. Um, do you approach it as a very sort of close knit with the the, the camera yeah. people to sort of design that? They always say that directors always have the the, the, the the pet department. Every director has mm, a pet department mm. where they actually want to do that job. Yeah. And for most directors, it's actually production design. It's always, mm. You always find the directors are, they really give their production designers a hard time because they always want to design it themselves. And for me, it's definitely photography. Where, I mean, I work very closely, I, I work very well, very closely with the, the photographer that I work with, Jamie Ramsey. But, you know, it is very much, um, I have an aesthetic and, and, and he he likes and invests in that aesthetic and so when we frame things up um, I'm always about symmetric so he likes mm. to do things a bit often and I'd always literally just like move his body and straighten the frame because it will drive me nuts if it's yeah. if it's sort of like off but I mean we we come he, he does you know a lot of this movie he, he, he operates the whole film so there's so many moments that he's organically just feeling out because the actors yeah. are running around him and so that's how much trust is between us that he mm. creates the look as well without without any kind of you know constant guidance. I just sit and watch, kind of. I just you know yeah. appreciate. That. Yeah, and then uh, there's there's I think a, a, a slight documentary like feel to the movie mm. in terms of um, I think especially it's it's very easy to compare this to something like Canari, <laughs> but I think it's it's very obvious from the very beginning of the movie like. Maybe a similar situation, but two very distinctly different films and different treatments of the of the thing, and yeah. and one key factor of that to me is is the 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 photography feels documentary like where something like Canary is is way stylized and and, mm. and, and hyper real and mm, it's a musical of sorts as well. Yeah. yeah, and and this feels very sort of almost like. People are doing their thing, and a camera operator is is, is, is there finding the story and, 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 and capturing that. Yeah, I mean, uh, as the, the Canario, I think, is the tension in that film is very much about his religious kind of conflictions, mm -hmm. about his sexuality, and we don't really focus on that in Morphe. It's very we really focus on the system, the the, the political yeah. system, um, and its impact on these teenagers um, but I, I've been saying to other people as well you know we were we, they came they were they started to make Canary while we were making Morphe because that's mm. how long we've been making Morphe for so we you know they were able to make the film release the film when we were still making Morphe oh. because we just we just took that much longer to to decide on things and casting particularly um, but yeah we when we knew that because we our teams are quite interlinked we know a lot of the same mm. people and we know those people who made the film um, they did share the, the share their script with us because we were like, well, you know, somebody else is going to make a, a subject matter like this. You know, we we, that we we always check and see if it's worth making ours. Yeah. But when we read their script, we realized that you know they were never going to be mm. the same. Yeah. 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 There's there's no I think competition. No. Kind of, kind I think the intentions are different as well. Yeah. 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 Um, and then one thing I really loved about the movie is the the use of music. 
Mm. Um, not only sort of source tracks, songs from the time, yes. but also sort of the the, the, <laughs> the score and the, the classic yes. kind of stuff. And, and how did that come about? Um, yeah, yeah, that was an interesting process because um, I, I thought I was very certain about how music was going to work in the film. And then on the second or third day of the edit um, in Cape Town, I just arrived at the edit with this piece by Bach and I just said to the editor, I think I want to just try this piece in this particular part of the film mm. that he had just sort of started cutting this little piece. And I sort of put it in there and he kind of swiveled in his chair and he sort of looked at me going like, mm, that's, that's kind of nuts. <laughs> and then I said to him like, no, just leave it there for now. Like, we'll come back to it, I'll, yeah. I'll feed it out. And then something about doing that, which he, which he, which he wasn't, he was definitely like, I could see he was like, mm, it's not a good mm. idea. Uh, he didn't think it was tastefully, it wasn't very tasteful to him. Um, but then I left it there, and the more I did that, the more it made me think about the behavior of the film, the music in the film, and that's when I started to kind of explore it in other parts of the film, and then I started, then I, you know, then I, I remember then I introduced the Schubert piece, and then I thought about this opera from Vivaldi, and then I was getting into um, the composer's work that he was composing for the film to also kind of have these this kind of interaction with the picture in certain ways where it's more, almost like sound design in some moments, yeah. um, particularly at the very beginning of the film, we kind of have this this tempo clock ticking throughout the first scene, which is actually very jarring in a film when you've got mm. you've got a scene where there's uh, non-diegetic music, composer music, there's music playing in the house, which is changing all the time because it's jumping through time and people are speaking. So you've got all the sound, mm. um, and so it was the sort of, either it was going to work, it wasn't having this... And then as the scene goes on, you know, the music starts to take over. And by the time that sequence ends and he's sort of running into the dark, it is the music itself. Um, and so it was, it was an experiment that kind of unfolded. And, you know, I was always, when the producers saw these choices for the very first time, I also saw them like turn in their chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, a, yeah, it's, it's a taste thing. You, you either like it or you don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but so so it mostly came through sort of experimenting in, in yeah. post and, and, and trying things. Um, yes, I I knew that I I knew that I, I knew they wanted to have an energy to the film, mm -hmm. and um, another thing was that there's a I wanted to play against all of the kind of emotional beats that I didn't want in this film. Like I didn't want it to be um, from a story point of view. I didn't want it. I didn't. This is not a love story, so there was never yeah. going to be a sort of like sex scene or any kind of like major emotional scene. It was a, it was always going to be just a sort of connection, very very slight, mm -hmm. very very held back, restrained feeling. And so with the music, there was never going to be music that plays into you know sen sentiment. Mm -hmm. So you know when the two when there's a sequence where we go into like the, the flashback structure. I remember the composer that, that produced something that was basically like the sort of like very sad, almost sort of like sweet and sensitive thing. And I said to him, like, I'm really thinking of using a 70s funk track here. And he was like, what the hell are you talking about? Mm. And it was just a sort of, that was like another step forward in the music was just to get to the point where we're really playing against it all the time. And it sort of has an impact, I think, on the way the form plays out. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I think sort of bold choices <laughs> in, in general. In, in Barack, of, definitely Barack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but okay, so so the movie's coming out now, thirteenth of March. Yes. Um, Friday the thirteenth of March. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're not superstitious. No, I, I, we, I, we think it's good luck actually. We'll see oh. good, like no, it's, it's a good sign. Um, and then, but but it's been playing at festivals and things. Um, how's that journey been? Uh, yeah, we're very grateful that the festival journey has been uh, pre-coronavirus because you mm. know we've, we've been traveling a lot. Um, it's always interesting to take a film to different parts of the world. It always makes you realize how, um, so how weird, what a weird thing cinema is because it, yeah. it's, it, you tell a story and it's about a very particular place in time and you take it somewhere else and that audience is sort of uncovering this place in time for the first time. So mm. they, they all walk out going, I have no idea this, about this war. and this, They understand apartheid, of course, but it's like a revelation to them. So it's always yeah. interesting. To, it feels like you're taking, it's like you're landing on the moon all the time. Mm. Um, mm. So yeah, and then we've gone. We, we go. We've been to like the, I went to the I went to the North Pole in January to show the film in the in the, in the Arctic. Oh, yeah. um, and so there's like very Nordic people, and there and so you've got that kind of audience, and then you've got a Mexican audience or an mm. American audience. So yeah, no, it's it's the it's an amazing thing to take to take a, a a piece of work and travel it like that. Yeah, but but it's 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 generally been sort of well received. Yeah, all over. I mean, it's, you know, it's like an avalanche. These things, you know, your premiere is always has a has a huge impact. If you mm. if you get um, 
a strong response at those big festivals, it sort of rolls on. You know, it's, it's, it sort of sets the tone. And, and, and the higher the tone is set, you know, the stronger that, re, that response is at that initial festival. If it is one of those festivals where there's so much media, yeah. it kind of just takes on a life of its own. It's like, it's like lighting a match. Um, so we were just very lucky with Morphe that um, when we premiered in Venice, the, the, the trades got behind the film in a very big mm. way very quickly. And that's, that has a huge effect on, on sales and on festival interest. And, and then the phones just, like, all the emails start dropping yeah, and the phones yeah. don't ring anymore. <laughs> and, and, I mean, that's also sort of why, I, th I think, from a local perspective, people might wonder, why make this South African movie and then premiere it and, like, yeah. Venice or whatever? And yeah. I, I guess that's, that's why. That's the reason. Is it's a business, to yeah. To get that ball rolling. <laughs> Filmmaking is definitely a business. And... Uh, you know the, the way the festivals work is essentially there are th there are three big festivals. There's Cannes, Venice, and Berlin, and there are market festivals. And you know every single major trade paper, every single major newspaper, every single major media, film, media, sales company attachment mm. attend. And if you're in the competitions in those festivals, because that's where you want to be, you want to be in the curated section of these yeah. of these festivals. Then you are then you are going to be sliced and diced by these people and. That has that is the that is the life or death of your film, mm. because if you win a prize at the festival, if you become the darling of the of the critics, and you sell very well, then you know that's basically the t the task of the film has been achieved. Mm. Um, South Africa is not a very big cinematic market for films because South Africans don't go to the movies actually quite a lot, and when South Africans do go to the movies, they tend to watch American films. Yeah, um, South Africa, like you know, statistically, South Africans prefer escapist cinema. Mm. They like to go to the movies to kind of just switch off the like roller coaster rides. So you know, for a film like this, it's an uphill battle to try and get South Africans to go to the movies and watch something that's about them in mm. a way and mm. about their personal history because it's a different kind of movie experience. You don't walk out of Morphe kind of going like, well, that was a rush. And like, you yeah. know, it's a kind of film that's, you know, it's, it's meant to penetrate you in a much, a much more effective way. So it's also trying to build an audience here. But in, in, you know, in Europe, particularly, films like Morphe will play in like hundreds of multiplexes because for European audiences, this is very much commercial content yeah. because their palette for cinema is so broad. Um, so it's it's this is a very particularly complex market. Yeah. So I mean, um, speaking of European markets um, or, or viewers, uh, audiences, and and you mentioned a sort of a, a, a Polish approach to filmmaking. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think those things align well? Um, yes. I mean, I because I because of the film school that I went to, I was kind of initiated into and I think it was always the kind of cinema I like and want to make mm. and what I kind of refer to as human interest cinema I, yeah. I make films about people not about cars or events or yeah. avalanches or, or t tornadoes um, and so there's a there's a there's a history of consuming cinema in that part of the world which is where cinema is meant to be upsetting it's meant to upset you not in like yeah. make, make you angry but upset your kind of rhythm yeah and that's what they crave. That's what you know. Particularly a French audience, they want to go to a film and they really want to be challenged. They want, yeah. they want to be provoked. And that's kind of what I do. So it always makes, it always you know the films always do very well in places like France, particularly because you know that's kind of the intention of the films. And that's why you know going to Cannes with the film for me is also very important um, because they kind of celebrate that kind of cinema, you know, quite quite profusely. Mm. And that's also the the kind of movies you prefer to watching. Um, it's hard now because <laughs> now that I make movies, watching those films is difficult because it, it's not so relaxing anymore. Yeah. Because because I'm looking at the construction and I'm looking at the filmmaking and yeah, it's not. If I really just want to like switch off, then I have to watch reality television. I can't, I can't watch mm -hmm. movies, but I do watch a lot of movies and you know I also know a lot of these filmmakers now. I've met them. Mm -hmm. So when you're watching these films, you're also watching them with the filmmaker in, in yeah. mind. Um, so that's another like you know and reason to to keep watching is because they become your friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of how you feel about cinema now. <laughs> what did you what did you sort of grow up watching? No, I grew up watching everything everyone else did. You know, mm -hmm. from The Little Mermaid to Mission Impossible. Uh, in terms of movies, I think the first time I f saw a film that was sort of provocative in this way was uh, I, I mean I remember I was a, I remember seeing Requiem for a Dream way too young mm. and I remember seeing Eyes Wide Shut 
and knowing that there was something about them that was dangerous in a way. Yeah. It was a dangerous message. It was like just dangerous like a teenager. Like this is not mm. this is not Mission Impossible. <laughs> yeah. And then I kind of um, started seeing other things like the crying game and um, you know then I I started having a different kind of understanding of movies and I started looking for those films more. So by the time I got to high school, I was that weird kid at high school where everyone was like, let's go watch this movie. And I wanted to go watch, because I remember The Matrix came out when I was in high school. Mm. So it was like, let's go watch it. I would go and watch The Matrix, but then I also wanted to go watch a movie called Before Night Falls, which I remember dragging my friends to one day. It's a film by, um, um, he's an artist. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it stars Javier Bardem. It's about a Cuban, it's a, it's a biography, a bi- biopic, and it's very artistic. Mm. Uh, Julian Schnabel is the director. And, you know, it's just not with my teenage friends I yeah. wanted to watch. It was three hours long. <laughs> Nothing really happens in the movie. And it's very, like, meditative. And so, and I was kind of in it by then. I didn't, I saw this as, I was able, it's almost like it's muscular. The more you expose yourself mm. to slower narratives and to meditative narratives, the more comfortable you get. But in the beginning, so like for South Africans mainly, you know, even subtitles scare them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of subtitles, um, Sorry, this is sort of jumping all over the place, yeah. but but um, Parasite winning, yes. winning winning the Oscar. Do you have any sort of thoughts on that? Do you, do you, do you think that it, it it feels <laughs> like there's potential for for people opening up slightly more to sort of foreign films, especially I think, American yeah. viewers? But all forms of foreign films, the majority of the yeah. world does not speak English. The vast majority of the world speaks something else, and so that entire audience is watching forms of subtitles. It's only English, like you know, Western markets that mm. are like sort of childlike, still going like, "Oh goodness, t- subtitles." Yeah, you know, if, uh, every French audience that goes to watch a movie that's made in English is reading subtitles. Every Polish audience, so it's, you know, it's 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 silly to um, to be pandering to the English market like this. But Parasite, mm. you know, is one of those perfect examples of just a film that resonates everywhere yeah. and. You know, I can I can only imagine how bored uh, Bong must be of promoting that movie because you know he started in Cannes, he won the Palme d'Or in Cannes last May, and it's just been parasites up until the Academy. He's won yeah. every major award you can win for a film in a year. He's won he won every single one of them. Yeah. Um, and so I'm you know he must just be like super annoyed. I think everyone wants to hear the word parasite ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an amazing film. I've actually seen it twice. It's so good. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You spoke about sort of foreign movies or, or, or subtitled movies um, and I think Muffy is, is, is it tells the sort of South African story but it's obviously not catered for South African market it's, it's obviously not <laughs> not built to appeal to a mass market we, kind of thing. we always hope to appeal to as big an audience as we can um, I suppose what it's not trying to do is uh, be too um, safe yeah and you know, Moffy's an expensive movie. Like, comparatively, mm. it's an expensive piece of work in the sense that you know, when you think about a movie as a product, you know, uh, which a lot of producers do, yeah. you know, they, they're talking about what what does it cost to build that product, and so how much are we going to make from that product? Mm. Um, and that's very boring talk for me, but I also I have to understand it because I'm building that product for them. Um, yeah, yeah. Is so someone's paying for it and, yeah. and, and wants the return on that investment? And so you know, it's a, it's like anything. Like if if you make a cell phone and I make a cell phone, but it costs five thousand dollars to build my cell phone and it costs a hundred dollars to build your cell phone. Yeah. Then you know it, you can sell your cell phone for two hundred dollars, but I have to sell mine for ten thousand dollars. So it has to be worth it. And Morphe's kind of like that. Morphe. The South African market could never sustain Morphe completely. Yes, it needs to. Morphe needed to to have international appeal and to be sold and, and distributed all over the world as much as it can be because it needs that much uh, that amount of audience to go and see it mm. for it to, to make a return. Mm. Um, so it's, that's the risk you take. You know, the bigger the canvas, the more people that need to come and see it or buy, or buy it. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, South Africa. You know, as much as I try to always make my forms. For South Africans being the primary people in my head when I'm mm. thinking about it and when I'm directing it, I don't want to uh, like alienate or, or, or isolate the South African audience. But at the same time, you know, I don't make romantic comedies, and I think if I did yeah. make romantic comedies, you know, that would probably be easier to sell to the South African market. Mm. Mm. But yeah, so speaking of sort of uh, alienating, um, I, th- I think there will definitely be some alienation. <laughs> Based on the title alone, I, th- I think yeah, the title course, is yeah. sort of in your face and and it's and, and in way, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's it's the original title of the book, right? It is, yeah. So it's it's not a not an invention for the movie. No. Um, but 
Were, were you involved in the decision with sticking to that title? Because I, yeah, I mean, it's did, obviously still a decision to. We debated it a long time. Um, the producer Eric Abraham, he for him, he was like that's an undeniable thing that we would always call it Morphe. He mm. he just saw it as being you know essential. And uh, when I wrote, there's a particular scene that I wrote. At one point, when I wrote the scene that's in the film, once I wrote that scene, I realized that that was that we had now created the sort of sem- central thematic scene of the film, mm. and it, it now made sense to me that the film should be called Morphe. And so up until that point, I was kind of always going, you know, should we, shouldn't we? But when I, once I had that scene, it was sort of it was es- es- essential. But it's also, you know, it only really provokes people here overseas. It's yeah. just Morphe, and yeah. everyone thinks it's a really cute thing. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, there's a there's a um, I don't know how involved you were with a with a publicity campaign with the celebrities talking mm, about that was it. Me. I, did, I did the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Their, their personal stories, and and that kind of makes me think of, of Peter Dutch, yes. who said that it's <laughs> sounds like a cat. A, yes. Yeah. There's a there's a cuteness to the word. There's yeah. a, it's an appealing word if you if you strip away the yeah. the meaning in the context. Well, that was the other thing when when I, when I decided that we would call the film Morphe, and we all agreed. Um, when we came to promoting the film here, I then also thought, okay, we can't have this opportunity of of putting this word out in the public in the ways that we're going to. Um, because even when we shot the film, it was called Conscript. Mm. So Conscript was the name of the company. Everyone was contracted to Conscript and everyone referred to it as Con- said Conscript on the call sheet. Yeah. And everyone said, I'm making this movie called Conscript. And we did that because it was just always weird for our producers and p- our production people to pick up the phone and go, hi, it's Oliver from Moffy. Yeah. Can I please have those trucks? So we had a working title for the shooting of the film, but always knowing that it was going to be called Moffy. Mm. And so when we got to this point, I said to myself that I need to do something that does create discourse around yeah. the title. Um, that doesn't that kind of takes it beyond a movie and kind of just you know if we're going to create this sort of social discourse about what this word means in our society, then I was going to find a way of creating some content that would speak to that. And so then I reached out to these people, uh, people who I know, people who I didn't know, people who I admire, who I feel like I've, I've witnessed them having to you know, come to terms with their sexuality in a very public way. Mm. And they all said yes, um, and they all would, they would come on their own sometimes, and they would sit in the cinema by themselves, and they'd watch the film, and then they would walk into a little studio and sit down with me for like 20 minutes and they would they would tell me their history with the word morphe yeah um and it was so interesting to hear the different stories and i think Mm -hmm. every gay person who's or any man who's ever had that word weaponized against him and and it's actually stung or hurt in some way has a memory of of when that was when the first time was that that word was sort of they became conscientized to it yeah um and all of these these guys have that and peter doug is quite funny because he was called this word had no idea what it meant but he thought Mm. it sounded really cute yeah (laughs) and then when he realized what it meant it it obviously changed for him yeah yeah, um, but but yeah, it, it was also interesting because there's a sort of broad scope of, of stories. You know, uh, yeah, I wanted to be like different you, you, kind of perceptions and perspectives. Yeah. It's, it's not the sense of 10 people telling the same, same story. Because every person's story is going to be different. Yeah. Think, and that's why, you know, even the one that we have in the film is that, you know, that's our imagined story for the, for the character. Um, but it was also an interesting... I think it's also about the fact that a lot of people, you have to overcome this word. Mm. You know, you have to, it hurts you, it, 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 it wounds you in some way as a young person. And then there is this, you have to have this process, which is why I always call it a relationship with the word morphe, because it's kind of, mm. it feels like you date this word in a way. And at some point, like a lot of, I think Mark Lottering says that, you know, he now has, he has taken ownership of this word and, you know, in, in his company that's, that does his current stage play, um, they refer to each other as morphe as a, as a term of endearment. So... Mm. You know, it's 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 a complicated thing. But like all words in South Africa, anything that's like racialized in this country or, or sexualized in this country is always, you know, hot hot potato kind of. Topic. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, I, I like the idea of 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 that sort of claiming the word and, and, mm. and taking power over it. And to try and like to take out the sting. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, we. I find it really funny that we've got these billboards up everywhere um, <laughs> because, you know, you drive out of Cape Town Airport at the moment and there's this massive billboard that just says Morphe and I can't imagine what people must be thinking in their cars. Like, what the hell is that? Yeah. Like, uh, clearly it's a movie. It's clearly army because it looks like the army, but... You know, it's just it's just there, um, mm. and it's and it's people are now inadvertently having to engage with it beyond yeah. beyond even seeing the film. They just know that there's something with this word, and I think that's 
that's also kind of fun. It's, you know, we are making people, you know, bring it to life in a way that out, like, forces them to engage with it in a way. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you feel a sense of responsibility in terms of those kind of discussions and those kind of messages? Um, as, as, as a filmmaker? As, or, um, I, I think as someone who has some part in putting that word up in a, on a... On a Billboard. Do you feel it's responsible to now sort of have that discussion and not just put it up on the? Podcast? Yeah, I mean, and we are having the discussion. I mean, that's kind of we are doing it. But I mean, filmmaking's you're a provocateur. You know, your mm. your your job, my job, is to provoke. It's to question. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. You know, I am. You know, it's a, what's really amazing when you I read all these comments. Like I get keep getting sent all the comments from all these guys. You know, that they're experiencing on. But it's just in like over overwhelming. Uh, outpourings of love and affection and mm -hmm. you know encouragement and people are inspired people tell their stories about like you know it, it, the minute you open up something like that and you give people an opportunity and a space to engage with something that is deeply personal to them as well yeah it kind of there's this thing that happens that goes way beyond the film mm -hmm. i mean it's 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 about men particularly um, closeted men uh, seeing these videos and feeling um, empowered enough to to be and live their authentic life yeah yeah. Um, okay, so back to the, the, the movie again. It's sort of based on a book. Yes. Um, where did you first read the book, or, or, or how did that, uh, that connection happen? I was, I was uh, the producers reached out to me. We met, I met uh, Jack Sidey. Mm -hmm. And in the course of a lunch, he just kind of casually asked me, because you always know when a producer wants to meet you that they've possibly got a project they want to discuss. Mm -hmm. you, know, you always talk about other things for hours. And then eventually he was like, have you ever read this book called Moffy? And I hadn't. And then he's like, well, we're, we're interested in it. We've optioned the rights, you know, read it and let us know what you think. Maybe if you're interested, we can talk further kind of thing. And then I read it. It took me a while to read the whole thing because I was promoting another film. And when I read it, I said to the, I called them back and I said, like, you know what, there's something that I might be interested in. I'm not sure mm. what it is. Mm. And they were like, yeah, there's also something we're not sure. Let's let's try and find the something. Yeah. And then we hired a writer and he gave a draft to Bash. And then we hired another writer and he wrote an entirely different film. And then that process kind of unlocked for, for myself and I think for the producers what we actually wanted to make. And then we took on the task of writing it ourselves. Mm. And that's where we got to with the version that we now have. There you go. Uh, but yeah, it was an exp we, we explored the theme for a long time, like three years. Yeah, and, and that sort of local producer as well? Uh, no, this is a British production company, Portobello. These are two British producers. Okay. And then I have a producing partner, Teresa Ryan von Kran. And so basically what I do is I sort of start a project and I sort of, the writing is a very solitary thing. It's just you and the computer mm. and, you know, sending it off to a producer, a financing producer. And then when you get to the point where you, you suddenly feel like, okay, it's coming together and if there's money already attached to the film, I'll say to them at some point, I think we should actually, we should ask the cast, across a casting director or in my case the casting really because I have a regular yeah. one to start looking at cast mm. so there's never like the official we're making this movie yeah. it's just like you start expanding the team and then I'll call Teresa and be like so I'm sort of getting ahead with this Morphe movie I want you to come on board and start you know budgeting it and let's talk about price tagging it and let's start looking at crew and so then she starts in that direction and then before you know it we've cast the film and we've location scouted the film and we've chosen you know, uh, shoot dates and, and it's just happening and that's kind of how Moffy went. It was never, mm -hmm. usually with the film, like you have this dream script that, you, that you've now perfected and it's like, it can't be any better and now you're just shopping it around trying to raise money. Moffy, it was weird, the money was always there. Mm -hmm. It was just whenever we were creatively ready to, to start spending it. <laughs> Yeah, so that was very, very privileged. <laughs> mm, mm. And then you you mentioned the the casting process. Um, I mm. think you you got a great cast and all sort of unknown. I, I, I oh, well. don't think there was I mean, a most Africans are unknown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they're definitely they're definitely. I mean, it's just because of the nature of the fact that the characters are so young. Yeah. So you know, trying to find actors who are who's playing ages between eighteen and twenty, um, you're looking at. Uh, talent that are unlikely to be trained because they're too young to be trained. Mm -hmm. um, they're still in school. Um, so that was a yes. Uh, my first uh, sort of instruction to the casting director was no, nobody's going to be thirty playing twenty yeah. in this movie, and we need to find you know we need to find as many young faces as we can, which is a really difficult thing because it's not just about finding like one great actor. Mm. You have to kind of find one great actor that kind of has chemistry with sixteen other actors. 
Um, so we would constantly, I would, I would cast a whole bunch. We'd see a lot of people. We saw thousands of people from Moby. We'd see, like, yeah, we'd see a couple of hundred guys, and then we'd pick maybe 20 of them, and we'd take them to, we would fly them to Cape Town, and I would do chemistry reads where I would mm. do scenes with them, and then we'd swap them out. And then I would, so we would just sort of, we would tape those as well, and so we'd watch them back, and we'd go, okay, that guy kind of feels like that character, but then, like, does he... Does each fit with this character? That combination of yeah. actors, do they go well together as you know the best friends or the, the bully and his sidekick, etc.? And then you just keep constantly, and it drives the agents and the actors nuts because you know they came back for dozens of chemistry. So then they, they never knew like, am I in this movie? Yeah. Am I getting this role? <laughs> like, do they like me? Because yeah. they just seem to be like chess pieces that we kept <laughs> moving around. And then eventually we kind of locked on. The, yeah, but I mean every every time I see an actor. Uh, come up to me or you know, at, a, at an event or something they all just remind me that like you know obviously you know that I cast for this movie because you saw everyone and so they, they just yeah everyone everyone was very aware of this casting process because mm-hmm. they, everyone came in but they all thought they were making a film called Conscript mm-hmm. so okay and then, then the other thing is um, was there sort of training and stuff involved in, in, in getting them in mm-hmm. shape before filming uh, they all had to lose weight. They were put on a uh, weight restrictions. Um, they, yeah, it was you know the, we started filming this film in early Feb of last year, and so the actors had to starve themselves over Christmas, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> which was wonderful for some and not so wonderful for others. Um, I mean, basically, the big part of their training was to get them militarized. They had to learn about the military. They had mm. to go to boot camp, and they had to be dr- learn all the drills. And they had to. I just wanted them to get into that fear, that space of being fearful for their lives. Yeah. So we found a military advisor who could put the fear of God in anyone, but in a very nice way. He's very good. He's very sadistic, which I really like. He's always smiling, which I like. It wasn't like he was like the shouter. He just had this way of yeah. uh, taking control, and it did work for them psychologically. I think the minute we took away their cell phones and their free and they were like cooped up in a in a in a rugby um, on a rugby field like a, rugby, a clubhouse for mm. for two days. They they bonded. They'd never met before. Well, they, some of them had met it through these uh, callbacks, but then they were kind of grouped. Yeah. And the dynamic was created with the drill sergeant in the film as well. He was also there, but playing the drill sergeant. Yeah. So he was being trained to drill them. So that sort of power dynamic was basically being created in a sort of complex rehearsal kind of way but ultimately it's research um, mm. but they they hated it but they loved it I mean mm. it was mm. fun to see like them throwing up and like like having dehydration because I'm like okay now they, they're gonna have things to draw from when we start yeah. shooting yeah. which they did because the shooting itself was exhausting for them because of all the gear they have to wear yeah and it's hot <laughs> so. yeah no and I mean uh, that was one one thought I had during watching the movie was it must be hard to act being tired to the point of puking yes um, and so you know they they. I mean I think one of the hardest days for some of them we have a volleyball scene which took an entire day to shoot and it was like 45 degrees mm. and it was 45 degrees from like 8am and they're shirtless the topless they're just wearing shorts and they have to play volleyball all day yeah. and you've got extras in the background who have to play rugby all day and that's when you look around as a film director and you're like, somebody's going to die. Yeah. <laughs> like, this, is gonna, this is looking dangerous because there's just heat exhaustion and, you know, they, yeah. But it's, it's kind of, yeah, filmmaking has got that edge to it sometimes where, you know, you, you're pushing through something and you know that it's worth it, but there are moments where you, you just want to stop because you're so tired. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Which I, I'm, I'm sure is a sort of kind of appropriate, kind of... For for the subject matter, I think even oh, it can be any film. It's it's just it's just like a, for directors particularly, it's like a mental exhaustion that kicks mm-hmm. in at some point because making a film, you know, it's a one way track. You know, the you can't go back. Yeah. It, you must always every day whatever you're shooting on that day, you must get. And it's not like just get it as in shoot it. You need to you know get it in the way that will make you happy or that you think is what fits the film. Yeah. So there's there's just this continuous pressure that every day is the most important day of this film. Mm. And then there are days that are actually really important because you have really big scenes that you know you could never cut out of the film if you fuck them up. So yeah. those are even more stressful days. And those are the days where you have, you know, special effects teams and there's just more people and everything is slower. So time is ticking and that's when you're just like, you're going, what the hell am I doing here? Why don't I have a desk job? <laughs> just, yeah. Um, but then, you know, you, you, you get into it and, you know, and then you, you see, you know, you see the edits of them and then you feel like, okay, that was worth it. <laughs> 
but on the t- at the time it was freezing and it was raining and it was cold and it was the middle of the night and everyone was miserable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then it, it must feel really rewarding to, to have a finished film at the end of the day. It's weird, yeah, when you get to sound, because sound mixing is the last part of filmmaking. Because mm. uh, at, at some point in, the, in post, the, the things get split, you know, the, the picture goes one way and the sound goes yeah. the other way, and I go from one, between one and both of them. But sound ultimately is the, is the last thing. And when you get to that point, you're sitting in the mixing studio with all the engineers, and they have been, you know, not sleeping themselves for weeks <laughs> trying to mix this movie. You do get to this, it's, it's a, it, end, it ends with a whimper, not with a bang. Yeah. You end a movie like where it's just like, and it's done. And then yeah. you just go to sleep, and then you, and then when you get to the premiere, wherever that is, that's when it feels like it exists. Yeah. But when you yeah. actually finish it, you just roll over and switch off the lights because it's just been years of your life. Yeah. Um, so it's an it's an odd it's an odd thing. You, you you never it's never like triumphant. It's almost just like a second like mudslide finish, and then you you just sort of like go okay, well that's that was that was something mm. and and then when you get to the yeah when you get to the media events that's when you that's when it's that's when and it's interesting because it's i think it's true that once you finish a film it really does exist on its own you yeah. know you are no longer part of it and it speaks for itself in a way and people have a relationship with it that you are no longer part of either so that's the moment i think at a premiere event that's when that happens where people talk about your film to you mm. And they read into th- into it things that you did not plant intentionally, and they're taking things out of it that uh, that you uh, have not noticed. Yeah. And then it's like you have this separation, and then the form sort of drifts away. Yeah. And and you and you move on to something else. A bit like a a child moving out of a yeah. Room. It's a bit like yeah, exactly. Yes. And it, it does feel like you can, like they are children, and and they they all teach you different things. I think my all my films have always they they also they time stamp times in my life. So mm. my you know the, I kind of do see all the films I made in my twenties, which I've uh, there were three of them, and I sort of see the difference of those three films made in my twenties and this film being made in my thirties. I can see the difference in me just from mm. the way they all work. <laughs> so yeah. it's just like children. Yeah. But no, um, um, I'm 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 re- I'm really excited for for, <laughs> for people to see it. For, I hope they're going to see and, it. Yeah, and, and to to yeah to to just to have more discussions about it and, and, and see what what people think about it. I mean, I think it's like you know, it's 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 got a war movie element to it. It is kind of a, I got nervous when people called it a sub-Saharan. I mean, there was a comment about it being <laughs> relatable to Full Metal Jacket, and so I was mm-hmm. nervous when people compared to Kubrick. It's sort of no, don't yeah. do that. Um, yeah, and I think that for an audience here, there's something to take away from this, and I think that it's you know it's something to, it's there to be explored, and so I hope people are brave enough to explore it. Yeah, hope so. Thanks for chatting. Thank you for having me. That was of course Oliver Armanes. His new movie Morphe is in cinemas from the 13th of March, 2020. Go watch it. I mean, obviously. I got the opportunity to see this movie at the premiere in Joburg and it, it's really an incredible movie. I, I'd highly recommend watching it. I have another tiny piece of Joburg cinema news that I really hope other people are as excited about as I am. And that is concerning my favorite independent cinema, The Bioscope in Joburg. They've been located in Maboneng for almost 10 years. Um, a nice tiny independent cinema if you've never been there Um, but if you have been there the important news is that they are moving soon to 44 Stanley which isn't super far but it's a bit of a different environment to what they've been in for the past nine and I think three quarters of a year now they are running a bit of a thing on their website Um, you can go to thebioscope.co.za and click on exciting news and there's a whole page detailing what they're doing it's similar to a crowdfunding campaign but it's it's not quite that i think the biggest difference being there isn't a a specific goal to reach but they are doing a bit of a, a a fundraiser to help with the costs of the move and they're offering some cool rewards in exchange for that um for example for a 500 rand donation you get complimentary and bottomless popcorn for every time you visit the cinema for the rest of the year then there's the ticket benefit that includes tickets for movies um and then there's also bigger things for uh, individuals or companies or organizations who for slightly bigger donations but if you're a cinema lover these benefits are probably worth your while so i'd highly recommend checking them out um 
All the reward packages also include automatic sign up to something called the Cine Society that is a, a social platform being set up by the Bioscope team um, for people who love to go to the movies. Essentially, I think they're still ironing out the details, but it, it'll be something like an easy online way to link up with people who have similar tastes um, in movies and want to go see the same thing so you can meet new people, interact with people and share your love for movies. Um, hopefully we'll get Russell Grant who's behind all of this as a future guest on the podcast so stay tuned for that. Speaking of which, this has been The Flow Chats. It's everywhere you get podcasts um, so feel free to look it up, subscribe, If there's a like button, click the like button. And if you like listening to this kind of thing, please tell your friends. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. And I really hope to speak into your ears again soon.